So this picture is not really perfect because it shows superconscient above and uh, inconscient below in the hierarchy, though it is a three-dimensional or a round picture. So it is kind of two symbolisms together. So inconscient ocean is round also, um, which is difficult to envision. Uh, it is in between superconscient and our world. It starts with uh, Vijnana, uh, with a supermind of Vijnana entering or projecting itself into this empty space or into this nothingness. So there must be nothingness acting uh, and it is actually described, Suvarbhano, uh, there is a being which is uh, uh, described in, a, I think it is 540 hymn to Indra, where it is perfectly described that the rays of the sun are meeting the darkness and their interaction, their intertwining creates Svar world, creates these trilogians over mind. So overmind consists of interaction of these two, where the pure light in its own domain met with the infinite darkness, and they overlap, and there there will be the first division within the consciousness, the gap. So from there it starts, and heaven and earth thing is already in the gap, so to say. As it was described, it is floating on the waters of the inconscient because in conscience surrounds it, uh, that Abhava is around it. Uh, around it in a sense, very strange sense, you know, because there are these levels up to Svar, all of them are there, but at the background there is in conscient, at the background, if you like. Yeah? Mm. So in conscient uh, occurs immediately after the superconscient, as soon as the fall right. occurs, is that right? Right. It is that fall or that beginning of creation, as it was described, when these first four emanations fall back, so to say, or fall into their separate existence. And uh, they are all represented in this Vijnana, in the supermind, where the last one, Vijnana, is supermind itself, which kind of holds them or represents them. They begin to create. That separation of them from the source is the beginning of this action with the inconscient. Um, well, how, how else can we really better describe it? That the inconscient is at the background of everything here, starting from Svar world. Yeah? Uh, it is somehow in between superconscient and the world, in between it, uh, it is already there present, and it, uh, it how to say, mm, underlines the whole creation. Uh, it is everywhere. Without it, without this gap, there will be no separation of the being. And we see all these separate beings, uh, infinite numbers of separations. It is because of this uh, dark matter, if you like. If you look into the universe, you will see that 80% is dark matter. There is 80% of some darkness which we cannot describe, uh, which we cannot refer to or relate to, because it is um, not possible to know what it is there. There is no light there. So that darkness is um, the foundation for this separation, separated consciousness here, and being. Uh, consciousness leads, this separated consciousness leads one being into separation, into, into different perceptions of the same being in different angles and ways. And from there we have the movement of time and space. So space itself as a gap is that kind of uh, result of that uh, separation. So this description, I really like this, the description of 
the night sky, the darkness in the universe, and then the lights, pinpoint lights of the different right. stars. These become uh, the different lights. These are representative of the different lights of consciousness or the different lights of the gods. Right. And without that darkness, we could never see those points of light. Uh, no, we would not have them separate, so to say. We would not have them different. Um, we would not see them as separate stars. Yeah, we would have only light, as it is in superconscious. One light, uh, which is not separated. One being, which is not separated. Now, we have many beings now. They are all uh, children of that one being, viewed by consciousness, this separated consciousness, uh, differently. And because of that, viewing them differently in time and space, we have them different. And that's the beauty of this uh, uh, becoming many, or becoming uh, um, uh, yeah, another, uh, seeking for otherness of self. But we are all him, of course, all that uh, one superconscious being, only viewed differently through this deity or separated consciousness, or separative, or I don't know, separating consciousness. So what, what seemed a little um, confusing to me, so I get the transcendental, the daksha, amsha, surya, the uh, vijnana then would be the uh, surya, vishnu, indra realm, right? Y yes, interesting uh, that you are thinking of what are these triple uh, svar world, yeah? I showed triple supermind, Daksha, Amsha, and Surya, uh, and I put them in this hierarchy, as you see, mental, vital, and physical, because they will be reflecting this uh, uh, this uh, principle. This oh, I see. So you're saying Daksha is aligned with the uh, heaven, Amsha with the Antariksha, and Surya with the earth? Yeah, of his... Surya below. Yeah, no, 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 no. It's not like one to one. It is the principle of Daksha is the oneness of all. It is the most unifying element. Amsha is uh, diversity in oneness and oneness in diversity. And Surya is uh, the principle of diversity, this rays of light which it will manifest. So to say. But it does, it does then correlate because. Yes, it correlates. Is sattva. Yes. Sattva is, yeah, so it does, there is a yes. correlation between the three realms and the th these three gods, the yes. three principles. Exactly. But uh, in, the, in the kind of conceptual way, Surya is the individualization of that oneness. And that's why Surya is the supermind, because from there the whole individualization is taking place. It is the purpose of this uh, Bahusyam, to become many. And these three reflect uh, reflected in this, our triple world as physical, vital, and mental. Mental is the most unifying, conceptualizing. Vital is the more diversifying and holding in that diversity and oneness. And physical is totally diversifying. There is nothing in the physical world which is identical or similar even. So in that sense, they are conceptually reflected. And you are asking, what is there in the Svar world? What are the three godheads? Uh, which is not totally... Uh, yes, but I can say in my mm, kind of studies, I came to this, that uh, Vishnu will be that uh, Amsha level, uh, Vishnu, over mental level, yeah, in the center. On the top will be Savitar, and Savitar has the movement of Surya in terms of force, not Surya itself, not the Atman, right. but right. the Vashi, the Lord. Project, the projection of his rays, maybe. Yes, so his force, his lordship. And, uh, and the Indra will be the lower bit. Yeah? Uh, so is, is Svar the same as Vijnana? 
the same realm? I mean, you have them separate here. That's what, what surprised me a little bit. Um, Svara and Vijnana are two different worlds, yes? Vijnana is that uh, the Daksha, Amsha, and Surya, and Svar is the world where this, uh, these godheads of the Adityas are already acting upon this inconscient. They are already being separated in their actions. And this, the first, the very first separation uh, will be of Savitar's movement of the... Okay. So we have Satyam in the realm of Daksha, Amsha, and Surya, and we have Ritam in the realm of Indra, Vishnu, and Savitra. Even, even more difficult, uh, Ritam is also part of the um, superconscient of Vijnana. Uh, Satyam, Ritam, Brihat are three forces of this. Uh, it is rather Ritam will be Amsha, yeah? Satyam will be Daksha, and Surya will be Brihat, if you want. So, uh, Daksha is Satyam, Amsha is Ritam. And, and because of that, you, you have this sense that it is in the Svar world the rhythm will be uh, dominant. It is true, because of Amsha, because oneness, diversity in oneness and oneness in diversity becomes the major principle there. Uh, there will be the play of these two, and uh, there the rhythm is the major force. Yeah, yeah well, because I, yeah, I'm thinking of the Svar as where the dynamism occurs within the universe which yes. now becomes unfolding uh, truth right the, the unfolding truth of the moment or the dynamic aspect of, of truth so that's why I was equating it more to kind of that, that realm that Vishnu and Indra yes but if you imagine this simple thing that um, which is not visible on this picture the Dakshams and Surya includes Svar and includes heaven and earth. Mm. We have to unfold them, that's why we show them in the space. Uh, so if you were to, um, oh, I can't, uh, if you, <laughs> sorry, I get stuck on these things, but this is sort of how it helps true, me understand true. these. If we were to, for the superconscious, if we were to draw a complete circle the whole way around this picture mm -hmm. and call it the superconscious, and immediately below that draw another complete circle and call that the inconscient ocean, and then everything here would be within it, would that be a... Uh, uh, right. Right. Uh, there will be something like uh, the one circle will be superconscient, and within that circle will be another circle, which will be an infinite circle, the same infinite, uh, which is difficult to present in three-dimensional thinking. But uh, that can, if we can imagine as infinity, that will be the inconscient, included within superconscient. Yeah, and encompassing mm. Vijnana all the way through. Yes, Vijnana itself all the levels. Vijnana itself is that um, that uh, appearance of the yes, Vijnana includes the inconscient, yes. Separation of Yes. It is including the inconscient ocean. It is not separate from it, it is including it. And that is the the, the fantastic and difficult thing. And because we think that the infinite ocean must be outside the infinite or superconscient, you know, inconscient, and they have to be like two oceans, above and below. And that is our perception of those who are embodied within this darkness or within this world, yeah, manifestation. We have the perception of above and below, of the movement towards light and movements towards darkness. And because of that, we can't really get out of this picture because we n never saw it from outside, so to say, with his eyes. Mm. Yeah, yeah, 
that's exactly about what we thought of being conscient as literally, almost mm. literally below um, everything else. Uh, but this helps. And th- that's why, and that's why we find within the inconscient, at the bottom of that darkness, the light, the superconscient light, and uh, that's uh, that's the secret of the Veda, that they knew that the light is all over, all around us. It's not only um, it's not only above. Uh, and by the way, to go above is also a big uh, question. We cannot break through heaven and go above to the superconscient. We can't do it. We need Svar world to break through to us. And uh, for us to come to Svar world and to come to Vijnana and above, there, are, there was um, one way, it is to go through Antariksha, to enter that crack yeah, with consciousness and go into this passage which may lead you above or below. You may fall into the abyss of inconscient or you may go up to the superconscient from there there are two paths so to say and they are well described in Sri Aurobindo Savitri uh, which is uh, his experience but uh, we cannot we come to the heaven as the uh, ceiling it is a ceiling sealed we cannot as the same with the, with the physical we cannot break through that bottom to the inconscient, and we cannot break through the ceiling of heaven to the superconscient. It's like an egg uh, in which we are kind of held, sealed. But uh, the Vijnana uh, or the Svar world with Indra's lightnings can break through our ceiling, can break. From there they can act upon us and uh, and uh, bring their light. That's why what we can do, we can act from our antariksha what is here happening is very interesting that the the aspiration rising from the earth the aspiration which is rising from that uh, superconscious from below you know, to find itself within this darkness we feel it we embody it here but we have to support it with the um, with the word rising or coming from the depth of our being from the heart it is from the Santariksha, where Brihaspati is supreme movement is. So the Shiva, Shiva's movement from below of the supreme sun is rising and has to be met with the superconscious from above, but it cannot reach to it through this darkness. In the darkness it is becoming a kind of diluted, disappears. Yeah? It is uh, becoming weakened and so on. So it has to be supported by the word from within <coughs> the heart, from Antariksha, and that is Brihaspati's movement, formed, <coughs> shaped by the word, this aspiration, and by that pushed above, pushed towards heaven. And when it is pushed towards heaven this way, then Indra's lightning can break through and meet this aspiration, this Agni from below. And then Indra and Agni uh, become that, uh, when they are united with the word of Brahaspati, then we have the completion of the sacrifice. So these superconscious movements are meeting within this darkened space, separated consciousness. That is the, the idea of the sacrifice. And that's why the word is so important, because it is shaping the uh, aspiration from below into a new power. As uh, Rishi says, he created this hymn as a chariot by which he will rise to heaven. So he can rise to heaven now with this chariot of the hymn, of the word. That aspiration, that force which is coming from below is now shaped into the conscious force with intention to to realize heaven. Before it didn't have any intention clearly um, defined or it was not clear to the outer consciousness what it was. It was a need of something, a need of a better life, a need of some achievement, but it wasn't uh, formulated in consciousness. Uh, 
And that is the, the understanding why these hints are so important. So the word carries conscious force. Right. Right. That conscious force is what um, can meet, your, as you're describing it, that conscious force, which is an upwards force, can meet with, uh, with Indra's, um, with Indra. Yeah, Indra can respond to it, yes, to this can call. respond, and with his lightning pierce right. the, uh, the darkness of right. the unconscious, or pierce the egg of the unconscious to make a form of crack. I think so. He breaks the, the ceiling from above. interesting and a lot to think about or to meditate on so uh, but I like this picture I, I really um, really got the sense that this was yeah that there was um, it's a unique way it's a different way of explaining it than how I was trying to show it in my you know form that I sent you that had things kind of naturally going from the top to the bottom it's also all right. You see, we we have to only see uh, where our language is. Yes, we have to understand that it is all symbolic. We have to reach out to something which is real, and uh, using different languages, different structures, and uh, and for me, it's also a very new um, thing. Uh, I never could find really a language to explain it, but I always felt that every time you explain it, something is missing. And uh, something new you discover. <laughs> right, right. Maybe one day we will find the way to to present it totally. But uh, you see, we are doing it in time. This is the problem. When I'm explaining uh, to myself one thing, then other thing is fading away, and uh, that thing is uh, kind of getting clearer. And after that, uh, I take the other thing, and that thing becomes weaker, which was previously strong. Because time plays this, this kind of dilution of inconscient is constantly present, you know. It's, it dilutes the, the perception, dilutes the light, and we cannot really make it uh, come together. We cannot get all three movements together, so to say. And Rishis could make it. So, basically, it's a good explanation psychologically what is happening, why we cannot really explain it, because we are doing it with, a, with this in this diluted um, consciousness. Mind, mind is diluting. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, well, the mind. I mean, the natural mind, right? The normal, rational mm. mind is is more of a, has, a, has a more of a separating or contrasting or the quality of distinguishing rather than finding the unity and bringing it together. So we begin from a point of potentially of disadvantage if we don't move past the distinguishing qualities <laughs> right. Right, to, to the qualities that unify all these. Right. Yes. Um. Okay, Vladimir. Well, thank you for that. And I will mm -hmm. continue to work with it. <laughs> yeah. And speaking of the Ashvins. Right. And on the Ashvins I made a picture which is I'm very happy with. So I dared to do it. I put Ashvins like this force from the superconscious acting upon vital world from both sides, from the physical and from the mental. Uh, so to say, the knowledge and the power which got split, but in the superconscious they are not split, and uh, they are one and the same movement of consciousness force, which Ashwins represent. But in the vital world they will be split, uh, so to say, the being and the consciousness will be split, the knowledge and the power. Uh, and power will be on the side of uh, more in conscient and knowledge more of the consciousness. Uh, it, that play is there, you know. 
more conscious you become, le less powerful. More powerful you become, less conscious. It's it's the the law of our existence. The stone is very powerful because it is um, least conscious. But the more you become soft and uh, more knowledgeable, less powerful by yourself, not by the knowledge, by by yourself. And it's quite interesting uh, that. And you come to the end because it is because of this dilution of of darkness, which is present within the knowledge. Knowledge is not powerful. There is a split, and the split is that antariksha. Antariksha split this consciousness and power into two different uh, formations, uh, and these uh, Ashwins represent the unity of these two again within the vital realm. That's why they can cure and uh, they can bring bliss and so on and they are very effective for our life. Anyhow. Uh, well, they're also very much, um, I mean, this is, they, they're also c constantly uh, compared later on to the, the, the sense organs. Right, the two eyes, two, mm -hmm. two ears, and they cure. They cure a sight. They cure hear, mm -hmm. hearing. So, these sense organs operate on the level of uh, of the vital. Right, they are of the vital realm. So it's just to me showing their expertise within this realm to affect, you know, kind of this coming together or clarity. You know, clarity of hearing and clarity of, of vision, mm -hmm. um, being able to see the truth. Right. Um, basically, in the, in the yoga, they are compared with Ida and Pingala, these two movements of, of uh, the vital force within their being. And Sushumna is compared to Indra. They're actually breathing in and breathing out, or uh, cooling and heating conscious um, vital force. And in that sense, uh, they are complementary because they work as a rhythm. This very rhythm appears because of this um, action of consciousness and force together. Rhythmic kind of coming to the being of consciousness and being responding to the consciousness is rhythmical. And they, they're never given. They're never given separate names. I mean, they are the only pair of gods that don't have individual names. They can't be separated. It's one and the same movement. You can't have one movement without the other. So they're indivisible, right. if you will. They're right, right. Unable to affect in, as individual gods right. or as entities, but to, together. You cannot split them. You cannot take one Ashwin without the other. Uh, because that would not make sense, because they are acting upon each other, they're kind of responding to each other. So they're so unique in that way, right? I mean, they are the yes. only gods that, uh, that this is true of, that I know about. I mean, you know, whether it be twins like Yama and Yami, or other, you know, Mitra and Varuna, you know, Varuna, you know, gods that you seem to, to that seem to act together. Right. You know, don't have the individual, aren't acknowledged as ind indivisible well, energies. Well, uh, they have uh, actually some, um, some names. They have different names, but they're still, that name is still referring to them mm. collectively. Right, right. But we have Sahadeva and Nakula from uh, Mahabharata. Uh, who are also interestingly, if we observe their qualities, we will see because these are Ashwins, and uh, they are twin brothers, and uh, um, how they behave, what they do, what what forces they have. Actually, from there one can study Ashwins a bit, because there was the ancient knowledge there embodied in them. Uh, but anyhow, it's a complex, um, a very unusual pair with its force which is acting upon the vital in the healing or in the creative manner because they are two and because the vital is split into two and cannot unite itself so totally they can do it 
and that makes uh, to me more and more sense. Uh, but still, it is the most difficult question for me. Auschwitz, uh, Marutz are easier even than Auschwitz for me now. But before, also Marutz were very complex and difficult to see where they belong. Mm. All right. Uh, so here they are, Dasra. Uh, this we went through. And Nasatias also is a strange word, uh, which is uh, treated by tradition, bra by Brahmanic tradition and Sinai, but strangely because it, they say that they are not not true. Yes, which is a bit um, yeah, exaggeration of some kind, which you will not meet anywhere of that kind. Na asatya. But it is, uh, Shubindu says it's from Rutnas to reach out to realize, which I believe so, that there is Rutnash, which is very popular and used in the Rigveda often, which means to reach, to uh, realize, to, uh, to arrive at. So they are moving and arriving at, they're reaching, they can uh, make the difference. Uh, they're always in this movement of achieving. Can, can you use the word striving or not? Striving, achieving, but they're realizing, they're reaching. It's, uh, striving is not reaching, you know, uh, it's kind of, uh, kind of only moving. But they're moving and achieving and arriving at something. Okay, uh, we will take next verse and see Indra Epis. And here, Indra, Ayahi, Chitravahano, Sutta Ime, Tuayavach. We have to split it. Anvibhich Tana Putasach. Such an ancient language, it's really. After Upanishads, it looks like impossible to even understand. Mm. Upanishads belong to different age altogether. Uh, Indra, Ayahi, Kamo Indra, uh, Chitra Bhano, you are the uh, Bhano, the full of this uh, varied or I would say conscious, nobody translates it as conscious, uh, Chitra, but varied light. But what is interesting about Chitra, it is from root Chi, to be conscious, from here Chit, consciousness, and Chitra means this of this varied light, uh, but it is related to this uh, root. So it is full of that light of consciousness. And uh, we know this from other places in the Rig Veda, that Indra is acting with the light of, sun, of the sun, of Surya. His lightning is full of that light of Surya. Uh, so he is with that Chitra Bhano, by which also the light of Surya is called. Um, Sutta, Ime, these uh, drops of Soma juice, Tuva Yavach, Tuva Ayavach, they want you, they desire you. So it's a typical. Uh, Vedic word, Rig Vedic. You will not find such words in other post Vedic literature. Anvibhih, by this small, subtle, anu, small, by these small drops of powers or subtle powers, putasach, purified. And uh, Shubindu will be speaking on this anvi mm, as a uh, Sometimes they are compared with ten sisters, a Yurubi quotation, and fingers also, ten fingers of two hands so which are... Keep breaking uh, up again. Uh, these Soma juices desire thee, they are purified by subtle powers and by extension in the body. Because Tana means by the body putasach, purified. And who are purified by body? It is these um, heaven and earth, by anvibhih, by these ten sisters of the mind, 
ten luminous uh, powers of the mind and by the body, by the extension, they are purified, by heaven and earth, yes? By physical and mental consciousness, these streams or these delights of Soma are purified. Let us read what Sri Aurobindo says and it will help us a lot, this. As in the second hymn he proceeds uh, from the vital or nervous action to the mental, <clears throat> he invokes in his second movement the might of Indra. Uh, the outpressings of the wine of delight desire him. Uh, they desire the luminous mind to take possession of them uh, for its activities. And they are purified by the fingers and the body, as Sina explains it, and by the subtle thought powers of the pure mind and by extension in the physical consciousness as it seems to me to mean. Uh, tana and tanu is usually tanu is physical body, yes? But it is from root tan to pull out. And uh, it's a kind of extension. Um, how to put it? Uh, something which is pulled out. And from root tan also it is to sacrifice. To pull out the one being into many different beings, yes? To multiply to spread in the space and from here this extension of the physical body from here also this idea of prithivi as a wide extension of the physical being of the sat divine being in this uh, inconscient there is still memory of that um, uh, superconscient being that superconscient being was spread uh, became wide, made wide here in this world of inconscient. So there is still that presumption in this meaning. Uh, and that's why it is here said by the extension also purified the delight. By the extension which was made uh, from as a projection of the divine being into this material or physical being here, or consciousness. Well, it's easier to speak about physical consciousness than being, because, um, because, because it is that consciousness which makes physical being what it is. Yeah. Okay, and um, for these ten fingers, if they are fingers at all, are the ten fingers of Surya. Look at this beauty. Daughter of the sun bride of the Ashwins. That's why I was saying that they, she is bride, but she marries Soma. And this is very weird, because um, she, Surya, is uh, to marry Soma, and they carry her, but because they carry her in, her, in their uh, chariot, they become already somehow husbands. Yeah. It's weird because, you know, when I was doing a little bit of research on this, I would have to say half of the mythology that's out there um, claims that it's the Ashvins um, mm. that marry the daughter and not Soma. So there is some confusion, but when I read the actual hymn, it seemed pretty clear, you know, the marriage of, of Soma yeah. to Soma. It yes. seemed pretty clear that it was uh, Soma. But most probably here we have a symbolism which is difficult to crack immediately with our mind because we are used to either or. And here this uh, Soma is that what these Ashwins are looking for or represent or something. They represent that delight in the vital being, you know. They are full of that delight. They are seeking that delight. They, they come to it and they bring their own delight more. And it is mentioned many times, come to our delight and bring more delight. So 
in a way they represent this movement of Soma. Uh, but for, of course for the Vedic Rishis it is like um, a symbolism uh, which is uh, hiding the, the real thing and most probably uh, Soma and Ashwins are here somehow related. Our mind cannot really solve this puzzle. But In the first hymn of the ninth mandala, this Rishi Madhuchandas expands the idea which here he passes over so um, he says um, addressing uh, the deity Soma the daughter of the sun purifies thy Soma as it flows abroad in her straining vessel by a continuous extension the daughter of the sun purifies thy Soma, as it flows abroad in a straining vessel by a continuous extension. Mm. Varena, Shashvatatana, Shashvata, infinite extension. Continuous, he translates. And immediately he adds, the subtle ones seize it in their labor or in the great work, struggle, aspiration, samariye. The ten brides, sisters, in the heaven that has to be crossed. It's interesting, that it has to be crossed. So... Um, a phrase that recalls at once the ship of the Ashwins that carries us over beyond the thoughts. For heaven is the symbol of the pure mental consciousness in the Veda as is earth of the physical consciousness. These sisters who dwell in the pure mind, the subtle ones, Anviyach, the ten brides, Dasha Yoshanach, are elsewhere called the ten casters, Dasha Kshipach, because they seize the Soma and speed it on its way. It's uh, amazing. Such an elaborate uh, psychology. Yeah. sounds so beautiful too. Right. They are probably identical with the ten rays, Dasha Gavach, sometimes spoken of in the Veda. They seem to be described as the grandchildren or descendants of the sun, Navtibhih Vivasvatah. They are aided in the task of purification by the seven forms of the thought consciousness, sapta dhitayah. There, so they are supported by a thought consciousness of seven, so to say, supporters or uh, movements of this thought consciousness. Dhiti, from root dhiyai, to concentrate, to hold, uh, to think. Again, we are told that Soma advances heroic with his swift chariots by the force of the subtle thought, Dhiya Anviya, to the perfected activity or perfected field of Indra. That's beautiful. And takes many forms of thought to arrive at that vast extension or formation of the Godhead where the immortals are. Basically it confirms the same idea of what we were talking that actually this movement from below, this aspiration has to be revitalized, reshaped and directed upward towards Indra, to invoke Indra. And here these Soma movements, uh, this uh, juice of delight 
which has to be taken from the vital world by these mental powers and uh, directed upward. I well, and, and can it be that, the, that these drops of soma is actually enticing the movement upwards, you know, enticing? Right. Yes, so it sounds to me as you were reading this, and I'm, I wasn't looking at the individual words, but just listening to you, there, it, it sounded to me as if there's this awakening that's happening, you know, this, this, um, this opening of the awareness or of consciousness. It's like, um, you know, I, keep, I can't get that one picture out of my mind that you showed that uh, m mother drew that when she went into the inconscient ocean mm -hmm. and there she found lying at the bottom this mm -hmm. goddess who opened her eyes for the first time mm -hmm. mother saw her open her eyes for the first time so it's to me i was just kind of getting this this vision of this kind of awakening or this opening and this enticing you know mm -hmm. enticing for for one to awake <laughs> mm -hmm. to the truth mm -hmm. The thing is that these uh, ten luminous fingers, they are of light, of, of fire, yes? and Soma is of that juice of, of cooling juice of ambrosia, of uh, drought. And it is um, cooling light, and that is hot light, I think. So to ignite light, uh, Agni Shoma, yes? to, to feed the light, the consciousness of light, the soma is needed. The delight of the being has to be found and uh, distilled and offered to these powers of consciousness to be activated. So to say... Th so it ignites the flames. Right. Oh. It's a food for them, food for this higher consciousness. They, that's why all the gods are looking for soma, because they are, mm, how to say, strengthened, multiplied. They are. Uh, increased by this, uh, their light, their uh, consciousness is increased by this substance. Mm. That's why Rishis say we, we drank Soma, we became immortals. And that is the, the puzzling th phrase, it's a very common phrase, we drank Soma, we became immortals. Uh, why, how, how could you become immortal uh, by drinking Soma? Uh, because that light within us, true light, will be uh, ignited, it will be uh, kind of flaming out, and when it is flaming out, Rishi knows who he is. Yes, he is that light immortal of consciousness. Um, so here, the same thing: these ten sisters of the mental being, ten true agents of the supermind in the mind. I would say like this: uh, they are being um, activated. They take Soma and then they redirect this movement uh, towards the heaven and to invite Indra. And then Indra will break through and then there will be a connection. And once this connection on the Soma is made from all the sides, uh, then, uh, then there will be a growth of light, of consciousness within this fallen being and then there will be a transformation of the being. All right, Indra, Indra Yahi again, um, Dhiya, Ishitach, Indra Yahi Dhiya Shitach, Viprajutach Sutavatach, Upa Brahmani Vaghatach, Kamo Indra, impelled by the mind, by that Dhi concentrated. Uh, faculty of consciousness, concentrating faculty. Dhi is a very strange uh, and important concept in the Veda. Um, <clears throat> it is from Uddha actually, to hold, yeah? to s establish. So it is that holding consciousness which can hold any image of things and fix it. And that's why in the mm, Gayatri Mantra, we have this Dhi everywhere, yes? 
dhimahi dhiyo yona prachodaya. So we dhi and he will move our fixations of consciousness forward. But we must do this fixing of our consciousness. So he is coming, come with the impelled by the mind, ishitach dhiya, impelled by this concentration of consciousness. We concentrated our consciousness and you will be impelled, O Indra, by this. So you will come. Mm, driven forward by the illumined thinker, vipra jutach, jutach, that's also interesting, speeded up, uh, driven forward by the vipra, by the ecstatic seer or rishi. Vipra is r literally from root vip to tremble, to tremble in ecstasy, you know, when the ec ecstatic uh, feeling is uh, overloading you, you're trembling in ecstasy. Sutavatah, um, me, yes, uh, myself, so to say, the one who has sutas, who has this pressed uh, Soma. Upa Brahmani, come to these words, Vaghatach, me who express them in speech, me speaking. Uh, so, mm -hmm. is this, is this Sri Aurobindo's it is, the second one? No, the second one is Griffith everywhere. Very, very simple, but sometimes very useful to have. I like Griffith most, actually, more than anybody else, be because of his simplicity. A and he follows the rhythm of the poetry, which I also like. Uh, urged by the holy singer, sped by song, come, Indra, to the prayers of the libation-pouring priest. Sutavatah, yeah, of the one who is having soma. Sutta is pressed uh, juice. Vaghatah, of the one who speaks, of the priest. Uh, come to Upa Brahmani, to these prayers, to these Brahmans, uh, to these hymns. Yeah? Again, this idea that the word will be forming the aspiration in a new fashion and will be attracting uh, Indra by this. Yeah? Indra may reach out to them, to these uh, words full of, which accompany the delight, the Soma. I think... But again, the, the words just um, symbolic of intention? I think, yes, they are kind of shaping and directing these Soma uh, streams of delight towards the receiver, towards Indra, in this case. Because the delight is interesting, it is somehow within words, we don't see it, we think about Soma as pressing, uh, you know, uh, some kind of substance, uh, you know, crushing the, the, the plants and making Soma juice for them. But it is, truly speaking, crushing the, uh, our being by the, uh, by the words by the consciousness which is uh, acting through the words, through these vibrations. Um, I think that words and soma are very much related. Uh, words are the, the intentions uh, which are redirecting the hidden within our being delight towards this higher consciousness. Uh, They're the pounding stones, the crushing stones. Can, <laughs> yeah. To, to get the juice, right. the soma. Right, yes. Well, uh, they, they speak uh, about these crushing stones as uh, heaven and earth uh, sometimes. But heaven and earth also exactly this. Heaven is these ten sisters, fingers, luminous, mental being, and earth is this uh, word. And in the Brahmanic tradition, again, we have two traditions overlapping. Uh, here we have word rising from the heart. And later it becomes uh, the earth itself, word. I think it's more already mental structure. So anyhow, it's quite interesting that uh, words are important to which he has to come, to the words. And um, 
which priest is pronouncing prepared the soma and prepared the soma for him. So to say priest has the soma and speaks the words and Indra is invoked to come to these words because he has soma. <laughs> Yes, uh, and uh, somehow gods, they love hymns and they love praising for some reason. Songs to their glory. Yeah, yes. who wouldn't? <laughs> <laughs> Indra ayahi tutu jana upabrahmani harivah sute dadhishva nashchanah. Uh, come, O Indra, with forceful speed, to Janach, to my soul thoughts, Upabrahmani. That w why he translates soul thoughts, Brahman, it's also very interesting, uh, because these are these words. From the heart, emanating from the heart. Yes, emanating from the heart thoughts, uh, which are hymns. O Harivas, yes, or the Lord of Bright Horses. Hari is this horse of Indra. Harivas is a possessor, the Lord of Hari. Uh, hold firm the delight of Soma juice. Sute Dadhishva, hold in the Sutta. Nach, ours, Chanach. Delight, Chanas. So hold delight in the Soma juice firmly. It's kind of uh, very interesting that Soma juice is one thing and the delight in it has to be held by Indra firmly. Just think about it. What, what a complexity. <laughs> <laughs> well, and it makes it sound too. I mean, this, all of this is happening in the vital world, is that right? Yes, it happens here in this our manifested world, yes. But I mean in the vital. The, the reason I was saying that is when you were reading, oh, you know, O Lord of the Bright Horses, and it was like, oh, you know, Vayu is the one that always brings Indra to the Soma. Interesting, yeah. It's their offering. And so I thought, oh, Vayu, so the wind, the Antariksha, and this is, you know, Indra resides in this middle realm so it just appears that all this exchange and calling forth and what have you is um, activated within the the vital realm. Indra is not the dweller of the vital realm according to the Veda yeah? but according to the Brahmanas yes uh, and it is kind of interesting that he comes I think this is the movement that hidden movement through Antariksha you know of all the forces and because of that, mm, there is a confusion. Many times um, I have this confusion. Where do they come from? Where, how, either the, he is breaking through the ceiling or he is coming through Antariksha. Yeah? Mm. And there are two different movements, I think, and both of them are, we can meet. Most probably for Rishis, uh, there is no confusion, but for us, it's often there. But I even if it is vital realm, which I would agree with, because it is in this manifestation, I'm not sure totally, but Brahmani, yes, they are rising from the heart in the vital realm, so to say, in the, and it must be there. So, and you said that Vayu is uh, in bringing Indra first and Vayu is, in Brahmanic tradition, considers to be the first who tastes Soma, even. Uh, mm -hmm. Right. Uh, He's called first. And then, only then, mm -hmm. does he share it with right. Indra. I mean, Vayu, it's Vayu's choice to, to share it with uh, Indra as second. There can be a reason for this, uh, that um, you know, Shirobindo says that Soma itself is this... Um, uh, is this uh, sensual delight, uh, s sensual immortality within the being, within the embodied being, you know, which is uh, representing that ananda, 
Uh, and uh, he says it many times in uh, the letters on yoga also that um, why we are attracted to this world and to uh, its uh, things because behind these things there is this immortal ananda everywhere and uh, we do not know it but we know it within our being somewhere deeply that behind everything there is a hidden ananda and that soma yeah? so that's why all things attract us uh, we want to interact with them to have them to uh, to do something with them to enjoy them you know, it seemed to me also, so that's what I was going to ask you before, is, you know, this delight that we keep talking about, it's not just the ordinary delight that the God's looking for. It's not the delight we get in food or the delight that we get in, you know, a five-star hotel or so. I mean, this is a refined, very cultivated delight that the gods are looking for. And it, it seems to me at times that... Um, that it can be experienced, that it, it's experienced through, well, okay, so I'm just going to say this, and it may not be accurate, but it seems to me that this delight is available through the, when the, the senses are pure, through purity of sense, this delight is seen everywhere. But because of the veil, because of the darkness, there's also this veil on the senses, and so we don't see clearly the delight in the world. It's not obvious, let's put it that way, because mm -hmm. it's almost this film or this cloud uh, or veil that prevents us from naturally seeing all around us and everything, everywhere. It's nothing but this very refined delight mm -hmm. or joy. I, I don't know. But it seems I keep tying it back to, you know, the, the senses. The, the senses is what has the ability to um, to revel and, and, and to experience mm -hmm. this, this refined delight. Right, right. Um, um, sensual means that uh, the delight is embodied in the physical. And... Um, uh, so that means that they're the closest to the physical, vital delight. And um, it is that which attracts not only the gods, but also the asuras, and rakshasas and paishatas. Everyone is attracted to this world, but there are troubles with it. You know, to be embodied in this body uh, brings a lot of pain also, and suffering, and... Uh, uh, that's why, as Shubhendra says, only the most heroic beings can do this, you know, and uh, that's as we, who are human beings, <laughs> because we represent the Supreme and um, we are growing Supreme here in this manifestation. We are stronger than those oppositions. But Asuras and gods are afraid. And they don't want really to take trouble on themselves uh, to be embodied in this body. Uh, only avatars we know, but otherwise they would not really come here so easily. Uh, but they want to have an interaction with this world and to get this delight through us. So we are doing uh, them a service. We are producing that delight and come into contact with them and give them our consciousness, so to say, to wear, uh, as it were, that they will have that uh, delight for themselves. That delight is very, very attractive for them, the embodied delight in the physical, for some reason. You remember there was a movie, uh, yeah, there was a movie about uh, fallen angels, uh, and he, what he was attracted to most <laughs> It was peanut butter, <laughs> and that was real delight, more than a four, five star hotel. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess that's what I'm saying, Vladimir. Is to me, the delight isn't the gross delight of, mater of the material world, of embodied world. The delight that the gods are interested in is this very. Is a much more refined 
the light. And when we tap into that, when we experience that, then it's like beckoning them, and they come, and as they partake and join in that delight, then they help expand consciousness within the physical. Right, I mean, I'm right. just kind of making all this up as I go, but I'm saying it kind of expands consciousness within the body. But it's it's a it's a delight that it's not it's not just to me. It just doesn't seem like soma means kind of the peanut butter. The, the everyday, yeah, peanut butter. It's like, well, then here, have as much. I'll go out and buy a case of peanut butter and call the guy. I mean, it's it's hard. I mean, it's our job to first <laughs> tap into that delight, right? To right. find that essence of delight that the gods are also looking for, you know. And that that's the, the challenge for us is not to. That's why you know you, you project the senses outwards, and it can get um, caught up in more mundane delights, mm-hmm. right? That it's not the true essence, I think, is what the Veda is talking about when they speak about the delight and so on. Mm. I, I started to, um, to make these kind of uh, simplifications because I started to see in the simple world embodied already everywhere this kind of uh, miracle of embodiment of the divine. There is nothing uh, which is, uh, how to say, too mundane here anymore with this look. Everything is um, unique and uh, um, the delight is everywhere in in this body, in this extension of the being, because there is no other extension. Um, It's only um, what we have to do, we have to, to find the the word or the intention of consciousness to redirect that distilled delight, that prepared enjoyment, so to say. When we eat, what do we do? We eat the peanut butter, but we offer the delight to the gods, to the divine. When we do that, something happens. So we we do not partake of the delight. We offer the enjoyment to the gods and then this magic of sacrifice takes place. We ignite within ourselves those hidden gods within our soul and they come forward, so to say, and they are being um, activated. And, uh, so it's like karma yoga, every it, act. In a way, in a way. Uh, you see, what in that previous um, uh, discussion with um, Julia, uh, she um, interestingly proposed this uh, vision that actually the word, the calling for the gods is only an excuse, you know, for us. It's an excuse to activate, and, and I already developed this thought in that direction, to activate hidden forces, supreme forces within ourselves. So we name those gods, Ashwins, but we have them within ourselves. When we name them outside, in the outer consciousness, as Ashwins, and call for them as those who are within ourselves, they are coming. But they are coming from within ourselves. So it makes a sense that, that even because um, uh, to think that the delight is only uh, something very... Um, very different from what delight is uh, here in this embodied world is also kind of separating it or making it impossible to find or something. It's an enjoyment of this world, of simple enjoyments, of, of laughter, of the sun, of the, of the children playing on the street with the stones or something. It's full of delight everywhere, as you rightly say. And that delight can be uh, we can partake of it as egoistic beings, yes, make it for ourselves, or we can offer it to this higher consciousness within ourselves, and then it just multiplies this delight. Then we see more and more of it. Uh, they come with the delight. They come to the delight of this kind, and they bring more delight, as it is uh, said about Ashwins, for example. I am thinking that it is in that direction. Uh, there is no split on religious and secular world. 
the psychology of it is everywhere the same, must be the same. Well, it's a new way of why, thinking. Why, why is it takes if, uh, so I see what you're saying, every type, a common, a delight in everything within the world, and yet, and so I, I can understand that, but then why the, in the Rig Veda does it make it sound as though it's so much effort to get to that delight? <laughs> right. That you've got to pound these, these uh, you know, kind of do the pounding with the stones, you've got to filter it. I mean, there's this whole process that occurs before the true, uh, what, do, what do they call it, the, uh, not the, uh, the, the um, you just look at the, the pure soma juice, before the pure soma right, juice right, right. is available. Well, you're right, oh, yeah. Yeah. you're right, by the way, you, what you're saying, but it's good to start with, uh, with uh, what is happening, uh, to see the, the, the ba basis from which we start our journey. And then what happens is really interesting. Then that delight has to be, what is that delight? That enjoyment of life here in its fullness has to be really what is distilled. That means I prepare the intention of consciousness which is, all, which is rising from the depth of my heart, love, yes? Which will shape uh, this kind of uh, aspiration and offer this delight uh, so, to what would they come? To the delight or to my uh, intentions? That's another thing. So, we don't have those pure intentions to offer. We don't have the words, we don't have the hymns so easily formed. We need higher consciousness for it. Yes? And uh, distill, to distill the delight is also very interesting thoughts coming to me when you are talking about. Uh, when you come, for example, to some place, uh, you mentioned five-star hotel or something. Uh, you know, it's a good, good thing. Good uh, comparison. We come to five-star hotel. What do you really see there with your fresh, so to say, look? You see, ah, so beautiful. No, you don't see this. You know, you, you're surprised that so much effort and so much... Uh, how to say, concentration and work went into perfecting certain things and certain enjoyments which are not really worth having. Uh, this is the turn towards egoistic delight. All these five-star hotels, they are made for egoistic enjoyment. And I am never, never happy there. It's a funniest yeah, thing. a fine restaurant. Same thing, yes? Right, right, exactly. All this fine cloth, nothing touches me. And I, I'm coming to India or to some kind of uh, cheap, you know, hotel somewhere, eating some cheap food, and you can get some unexpected, absolutely, and you do not know why. Uh, but it is related to consciousness and not to the thing itself. Because the delight is in every single thing. It can be only distilled with the consciousness and offered to the higher consciousness or not. And here we have this dilemma, which you are rightly saying. Is there consciousness working to distill it? Or to prepare and to offer it to the higher consciousness or not. If not, if it is distilling, working and then consuming it by egoistic consciousness, then we have a completely different picture. Hmm. There is much to think about this delight, anyhow. <laughs> discussions on the Gita and Karma Yoga, that it's an offering that, that you know, if everything has delight right. in it, then every action embodies delight, right. or everything, yeah, every action embodies delight, and if you give over to the gods, make an offering of every, every aspect of what you do, um, then 
that does imply, you know, karma yoga does imply that there's, there can be delight in everything, and it's the offering of that delight in even the most mundane ways right. that can attract the gods. So um, anyways, I'm, I'm seeing from your side, <laughs> yes. what I'm still kind of saying, uh, uh, and can, can, can you imagine even that all these five-star hotels will be offered to the divine? What, what a beauty it could become. And uh, all the beautiful clothes and food, everything would be offered, all this delight to the divine. Unfortunately, it is not. And because of that, we have an idea that, uh, that poverty is spiritual and riches are non-spiritual. And that is, that is not true. That is not true altogether. V yeah, Vedic Rishis knew about it. Everything has a delight and can be offered. And those five-star hotels could be most delightful. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay, so shall we close with the mantra then for today? Yes. Mm -hmm. Om Bang Me Manasi Pratishtheta Mano me vachi pratishthitam avira virmaedhi vedasyama anistaha shrutam me ma prahasihi anena dhite na horatran sandadhami ritam vadashyami satyam vadashyami Tan maam avatu, tad vaktaram avatu, avatu maam, avatu vaktaram, avatu vaktaram. Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti.